Hello, everybody. Today we have taken up a very important topic for you, and this is about the consumption story in the new era of COVID. Consumption is a key driver of the economy, and hence we need to go deeper how this would be impacting local and rural economies. To elaborate this, for us we have the marketing guru Padma Bhushan, Professor Jagdish Seth. Who currently teaching marketing in Emory University in USA with six decades of experience in this field and written so many books on marketing and other contemporary topics. Welcome, you, sir. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, sir. And my first question to you uh, is straight: like uh, we've been seeing three dynamics, not just COVID. We are seeing COVID. We are seeing climate. We are seeing connectivity. Yeah. which is right. around internet and how are you seeing these things defining the consumption and do you think responsible consumption or in a way sustainable consumption is going to be a critical phenomenon in coming days over to you sir yeah uh, i think responsible consumption is the ultimate mission for all nations while we focus so much on supply side the production side and the distribution side in terms of impact on the environment transportation for example carbon footprint the real carbon footprint happens at home 75% of all the carbon footprint with the automobile as a part of the home architecture is basically produced by the by, by by the individual households so at the household level we have to focus more what can markets do what can policy makers do and what can consumers do themselves to reduce the impact of their consumption on the environment individually it may be very small but collectively it's massive uh that's the key phenomenon so i began to focus more on the consumer side and especially with responsible consumption or mindful consumption by and large let's take the covid covid is a live experiment and we have already noticed two or three things the first one is that people were in a lockdown or shelter in place could not travel and you saw dramatic changes in the air pollution because there were fewer automobiles fewer trucks or lorries as we call it in india and you saw a before and after difference in all the major cities whether it's a beijing on the one hand delhi on the other hand or atlanta where i live or los angeles any city there is a large personal transportation which means people are using automobiles more so than buses more so than motorcycles etc cetera, etc cetera. but we saw the worldwide phenomenon so covid has already told us that our consumption matters right. in terms of environmental degradation and we are the ones who are creating that through our consumption how can we do it in a more mindful way or in a more responsible way that's just one second part i did not expect this was very unusual for me i found that as people are locked in of course they have to deliver foods at home prepared by somebody else they can cook themselves but younger people don't know how to cook even right yeah which is interesting worldwide absolutely so here are here are three consequences people began to overeat at home mm -hmm. there has been a huge problem by being just at home no exercise no density and all family is consumption to get to, to together when i'm consuming and my children are consuming at school lunch and for example i'm at the office and consuming there consumption was distributed so i did not notice it how much i'm consuming now consumption is all localized in my apartment flat whatever we call it or the home in america and you immediately begin to see how much are we consuming made us very conscious mm -hmm. it also led to so basically people began to say i need to wake up i'm consuming too much how can i manage my consumption second thing is that there's a lot of waste the food comes at home and similarly by the way clothing for example people say i don't need the clothing so they're not buying any garments right now garment for work garment for home garment for relax it's basically the consumption is taking place but food is a key one so the waste of the food because you buy so much in a delivery way that comes in somebody delivers to you 
overseas uh, Grubhub, for example, uh, DoorDash, these are the kinds of companies, Uber Eats, and there are comparable ones in India. And people began to say, it's so convenient, let me just order it by phone or by typing in, by cell phone, however you do it, and you order more food than what you can consume. So it goes to waste. Most important change, however, is neither of those. Suddenly you realize there is so much of packaging that comes in the house. So how do you dispose it off? Disposition of packaging itself became a major issue because it gets into landfill unless you have a recycling approaches, et cetera. So consumers began to understand that consumption is creating huge environmental impact in the neighborhood itself, in the house itself, and in the community at large. So I do believe that there is now a little more consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now the so, problem is that once we relax and go away, then what happens? People go back to their old habits or what? That will be a very key thing to find. Or is there mm -hmm. some way policy makers or marketers mm -hmm. can actually take advantage and change the behavior of the people permanently? So, so you put uh, uh, the perspective, I think it is not just at uh, India level, but it is uh, all over. That's what happening all. globally now. So if we yeah. bring this concept down to the level of India, first question, yeah. do you think similar uh, eff effects will be seeing in India? And linking to that, do you think the Indian consumers post this would be more responsible while going for daily consumables, be it the yeah. food, be it durables, anything of that kind, even a service. So if yes, what would be the impact in Indian market of this uh, transition? Yeah, yeah. Uh, very clearly, it is very parallel, except there is a huge difference between rural consumers and urban metro consumers in India, clearly. Right, right. I think rural consumers, it is more making at home rather than buying commercially. Still, there is somebody in the house who knows how to cook, you know, how to clean, etc., and they end up doing themselves. So there, the consumption impact, overconsumption, responsible consumption is not as great. In rural markets in India, we don't have a refrigeration system. So you cannot consume beyond one day or two days. You cannot mm -hmm. store it. Right. And there is no sometimes running water Sometimes there's no electricity, whatever it is. So we have a constraints around overconsumption by definition. So in many ways, rural markets will not as overconsume, not just the economic resources, money, and all the stuff there, but that's not the issue. I think it's just the infrastructure for making it more convenient to consume just doesn't exist in rural India. And especially they make it themselves, mm -hmm. which means they're very careful how much they spend, let's say, energy-wise, you know? Now, is, it a, is it the oxygen gas that we offer, or is it old chula, you know, which is how I grew up, <laughs> pretty much, with, with wood sticks and all this stuff, kind of stuff. And right. so I think, so So rural will have less of the impact of overconsumption. Metro will have more impact. So uh, on the, the metro change, front, I need some more elaboration, sir, like, because yeah. that will create the real impact. And in metros or cities, we have so much of population. There are segments, like there are uh, uh, youth, yeah. then the, the couples who are just married, and then also, of course, the oldest. So how do you see yeah. that phenomena emerging now? Yeah, in metro, definitely overconsumption will continue because now it's delivered at home. No maids are allowed to come at your house to do the work for you and all the stuff. And if you're an affluent segment, upper socioeconomic class, you will definitely have the convenience of ordering, whether it is through Flipkart, Amazon, however you do it, you know, pretty much. So I think it's going to happen, clearly. So in the case of metro area, it is not the demand side, it is more the supply side. Given this opportunity, what can marketers do and what can policymakers do to make us more responsible consumers? That will be much more important. Uh, people will go back to their old habits, once the lockdown is gone, this is a great opportunity, living experiment to ex intervene in some fashion. So here is the key change. I think more changes will happen in terms of modified consumption, as I call it, because of the constraints put together in services. 
-hmm. not in product, in services it will happen. Okay. And I have two examples. One, of course, is uh, primarily what we call telemedicine or telehealth. Mm -hmm. It's such a hassle to go to the clinic or the hospital, metro area. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to wait in line over there for the doctor to show up, you know, because he's so busy or she's so busy. A hospital is even worse in India or every place, pretty much the same. So today people are finding it is more convenient to basically do telehealth as it is called now. Have a consultation by cell phone or by PC or a Zoom typically. I have experienced myself that recently twice mm -hmm. and one was a dermatologist and one was somebody else. Yeah. And then I found that I don't need to go anymore. So I'm now encouraging the doctor to see me as a patient, not in person, unless it's absolutely necessary. So there's a transition only there. Right. The doctors, the clinics, the hospitals like it also because they can, they can process more patients time-wise. Yes. And because it's a Zoom technology, you have to be on time. Mm -hmm. So I've seen more punctuality by the nurses and the doctors. They're able to do, see more patients, which basically in the private sector, they can make earn more money also it's a private practice or whatever it is. So it's a win-win between a consumer and a producer. Right. In services, you will see more happen. I, same I, thing will be true. Yes, yeah, yeah, Same thing, will, I'm sorry. Same thing will be true about probably education. Yes. So, uh, raise a question, please. Yeah, no, my point was, uh, that means you talk, you're talking about this whole internet, the digitalization is going to uh, a critical driver in terms of uh, accessing products or services. So you've been talking about internet digitalization uh, uh, in a big way. So I would request uh, in the current scenario from Indian perspective, uh, uh, tell us a little more this whole internet uh, uh, and how it is going to revolutionize this consumption pattern. There is no question that the digital age is more transformative than the industrial age or even the services age, which came in between automation of services. This is phenomenal on two or three reasons. First of all, this is the only technology that is a true democratization of technology. Mm -hmm. Even the lowest level income people can afford today a smartphone because the prices have dropped so much. Right. Connectivity still is a problem in very rural populations, but in Metro today, everybody has a smartphone and they have a Wi-Fi access mm -hmm. or an internet access in some fashion. And as we put more and more 4G and a 5G evolution on a national level, I believe very strongly that we will be having the smartness of the nation goes from a low tech to a high tech very quickly. And to me, the biggest transformation in India has been the cell phone revolution that took place along with the networks that took place. I mean, think about before and after, you can't even imagine that you cannot live anymore without a cell phone, yeah. whereas there was no need for a cell phone. So it's a very transformative technology. It is very egalitarian, as I mentioned. It doesn't matter. Affordability is remote. Accessibility is remote, pretty much. So it's more egalitarian, which means I can create a network and I can have a network effect, as it is called, which is multiplying, like social media are able to do. Uh, the content is enormous today. Everything is digitized. So today the library comes to the laptop. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go to the library. Yeah. So that's very interesting. So I think it's going to have a massive impact on the Indian economy. Right. So, so one is internet and digitalization that would definitely going to change. I think uh, then uh, I would like to take your uh, views on uh, from the rural perspective, the responsible consumption of food, which you touched upon, uh, how it is going to be, uh, uh, what is the correlation, the uh, responsible consumption, because we are talking about safety days now. We are talking about food with standards. We are talking about uh, people are more alert now when they uh, start consuming anything. So that will be a revolution along with the digitalization, the, the link towards uh, a better food, better produce. So in that yes. connection, how do you see how it is happening and what is its relationship with the, 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 the belt, 
the 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 rural which is actually the producer of this uh, food basket for us yeah there is no question that all of a sudden all over the world both emerging economies and advanced economies there is a belief that we have foods that have become too much processed foods so people are changing the biggest change you see is in beverages mm -hmm. people are drinking less and less carbonated beverages like coca cola pepsi cola etc and switching over to water right bottled water is a necessity now almost pretty much in india just like a cell phone is which right. is interesting uh foods also there is a huge trend both in india as well as in america and that is the trend to our more uh, organic foods buying organic foods less processed less chemical etc which will have a significant impact in the indian agricultural sector for example one of my former students mm -hmm. an mba student came again went back to india and today he has 10000 farmers doing organic farming and he basically buys from them aggregates them and ships it out to all of the advanced country supermarkets okay. in europe as well as in america so to me agriculture itself is going to be changing dramatically in many ways surprisingly it is going back to the way we used to do yes. before we had too much of chemicals involved mm -hmm. in the soil so soil preservation everything will come back i become more optimistic mm -hmm. that the damage done by us through our consumption habits especially in deforestation for example uh, erosion of the soil nutrition i think people are becoming very conscious that one can do a very right way and mm -hmm. still satisfy the consumption of other uh, population fantastic so that brings me uh, to a larger point like we've been working in rural space and low income markets for long now so people yeah. over last decade or so when there is a growth uh, happening in rural areas private sector corporates or big companies used to come and they almost took it for granted that they can start selling products services to the rural people do you think uh, now there is an opportunity instead of selling really developing some relevant solutions in particularly in difficult times and after that for private sector they would start following something like co creation going back to the real pain points developing something for the for the real masses do you think do you have any advice and also insights for private sector in india post covid scenario uh, uh, as we uh, start facing it yeah there is no question that there is a big market out there my estimate of low income consumers which is below 2 dollars per day income calculation mm -hmm. united nations defines that it's a 5 trillion dollar market worldwide already right. right growing faster than the average most of that is in africa and south uh, asia india being one of the key nations in the process so that market primarily is consuming unbranded products mm -hmm. and buying from informal channels informal channels with so many middlemen there are about nine middlemen involved in india from the producer to the consumer each one putting their capital working capital having a storage space etc margins are already eaten away by nine different people so there is a huge margin from the producer to the consumer but it is distributed therefore we don't see it right. what if i can make it into one step distribution or two step distribution so if i can basically have large private sector source it directly and and sell it to the consumers directly a typical retailer like big bazaar would be in that category or online flipkart would be in that category mm -hmm. i think that uh, that as supply function from rural market mm -hmm. by large e-commerce platforms is a very important initiative that's happening it's happening in fact right. pretty well same thing on the demand side the rural population actually is has more discretionary income i don't mean rural poor poor but people mm -hmm. who live in less urban areas mm -hmm. here is a contrast example If you take a software engineer from a good engineering college, ten plus two plus fifteen, he is in Bangalore or in Delhi or in Bombay, big metro area, or Hyderabad, wherever they are, he will be earning about I would say 
7,000, um, 50, I'm sorry, 50,000 rupees per month yeah. income. Yes, yes. But 20,000 will go as a paying guest living in some guest house, I mean, some family. No food capability. Then he has to pay for his food. And then he has a modern person, so he has all modern habits, has a girlfriend probably or significant other. They have to go out, etc. At the end of the month, he has no discretionary income. There is no cash flow. Mm -hmm. Contrast that with the crane operator in Mundra Kach, which is a port. Yeah. The crane operator makes 80,000 rupees a month now. He's married. 10 plus 2 plus vocational training. Mm -hmm. He's married. Mm -hmm. So the wife basically takes care of the aging parents. He's the breadwinner. The wife is a homemaker. She takes care of everything. And he has more discretionary income because he doesn't pay rent anymore. He's with his parents' house. Wife cooks, so there's no additional 20,000, whatever it is, amount of month for yeah, preparing yeah. food or whatever it turns out to be. And he has a lot of discretionary income. Now, what does he do with the income? First thing he would like to do is to buy a motorcycle because it's a mode of transportation for him, not a status symbol, right. to make it more convenient to go from his home to the port, for example, right? right? So motorcycles is a big market. Then second thing you would like to do is to make sure that his children wear better clothes. The wife can have one extra sari for festivals and going to the temple, which is a very important part of the life there. How can I take care of my aging parents? A little more medical help I can provide, you know? Mm -hmm. Get the doctor, etc., medicine, whatever they need, rather than postpone that thing. He still has money left. So he basically thinks what to invest in the future. Mm -hmm. So life insurance policies. Right. Think about that. Think about that. Yes. All invested for the children because he wants children to do more than just being a crane operator. Right. 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 That's the excitement of the non-urban markets in India. And I must tell you, sir, with current reforms where government is now talking about uh, local infrastructure fund of one lakh crore which essentially right. means we are now pushing this agenda of construction or building value chain supply chain at the last mile so your point right. i think in a very subtle way like those opportunities where this crane operator in different ways would be opening up in rural area and that would be a driving force isn't it right correct and it's very important that we modernize the agriculture sector Mm -hmm. It is still the same way as what we did thousands of years right. in terms of production. I don't think it's the aggregation of land even. It's just the technology one can use today. And technology is so affordable, especially wireless technology. Mm -hmm. I can use quite a lot of that to make agriculture much more efficient, more productive, based upon the timing of when to plant, when not to plant, when to harvest. There is so much of support I can do. And in fact, which is the reason why America came up in the agricultural sector all days. Mm -hmm. Today in America, one farmer produces enough food for about 75 people. In India, it may be like one farmer producing food for only two or three people. All right. All How right. can we increase that productivity by having the crops that are much more like a, not a plant-based or cereal-based, but tree-based, right. which means they reproduce again and again and again. We do cashew nuts very well, for example. Can we do almonds, for example? Uh, India is blessed with climatic zones where I can produce anything in any part of India, so mm -hmm. I can be very self-sufficient. Right, right. So uh, while uh, these opportunities now need to be uh, taken to, through value addition and all that, the one aspect would be private sector would definitely see this opportunity with the reforms. They will be the first one to jump into this and rightfully. But uh, India primarily, again, as you're saying, agriculture is traditional. So is the case with MSME sector. So it's informal, but they employ the maximum. They also, in terms of volume, their business or their size is good enough. But at the cost of this modernization, do you still believe the local entrepreneurship, the local uh, 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 the enterprises, even social enterprises, startups would uh, have a say, would have a kind of pie in that uh, uh, new phenomena that's emerging now? Yeah, we already have live ex examples, but we don't look at that. 
we look at the traditional private sector case studies or examples, etc. So each Opal, for example, you know, done by one of the companies, Hindustan Liver does something, you know, I mean, all this stuff. But the real change in India really took place in the 50s mm -hmm. and the 60s, when we started agricultural cooperatives. Right. The milk cooperative in Gujarat alone with Amul brand name is massive. Right. So one can aggregate the smallness of individual farmers still remain the autonomy that they have, which they like, and they may enable them to earn a lot more. Right. So to me, if Amul can do it, I can create about a dozen Amuls in different regions of the country. Yeah. And we do have milk cooperatives. So yeah. milk is the largest consumption and the largest production in the world by a long shot. As yeah. what we can do with the milk, can we do it with almonds? Can we do it with cashew nuts? Right. Can we do it? We, as you know, they, we have too much, we have the size but no scale because we fragment the market too much, both on the supply and the demand side. Mm -hmm. So somebody has to aggregate that together and that is the excitement in rural India or agricultural economy. Uh, right. To me, we can learn from the cooperatives, mm -hmm. work the cooperatives in the world. I mean, America is quite good about cooperatives, which we don't talk about. Right. Uh, raisins, people who make, uh, from the grapes, they dry raisins. We, we consume quite a lot of raisins in India. Mm -hmm. You know, they have their own cooperatives. They do advertisement properly. Their commercials are well known. Yeah. We have the cranberry people have their own cooperatives, their own brand name. Orange growers have their own cooperatives. I think we have to revitalize that cooperative in a more modern way today with technology than right. what we did before. Uh, but Amul is a world-class example in India. It can be done in India. In other words. Yeah. We are not able to replicate, but as you're saying, 60s had shown us something. We need to do it in a faster way in this particular yeah. era to support the large uh, agriculture base. Last right. uh, or the last segment, I would say, uh, by all means, public sector has a big say in India. So you've been yes. talking about that also uh, when I refer back to your uh, uh, articles or yeah. uh, talks. So in this particular, uh, uh, I think, uh, situation, how do you see just not from a procurement point of view, but how public sector can really galvanize for the benefit of uh, rural people or for that matter, entrepreneurs? What are your advices to, uh, to look at public sector more seriously? There are two very radical ideas. I yes. don't know whether they're practical or not. You know, at one time when we liberalized the economy in 1991, Mm -hmm. Everything that was state-owned enterprises, we said private sector can come in. Cell phones became the biggest one. Private banking came in. You know, so we have the ICICI Bank, HDFC Bank. You know, all were private. Otherwise, banking was all nationalized. I think it may be reversed now. Whatever private sector does, can a state enterprise do better? Okay. <laughs> it can be done. Mm -hmm. Right. And state yeah. <laughs> and state enterprises can be national up front, for yeah. example, or they can be state enterprises don't have to be federal enterprises. Mm -hmm. Each state can have its own. And in fact, there is a there is a good example. I mean, Mysore sandal soap mm -hmm. still survives, competes very very well. It's a state enterprise. I see. Okay. <laughs> and you said two so two do. radical ideas. What is the next one, sir? <laughs> The next one is really more the entrepreneurship mm -hmm. where the government can become an enabler by mm -hmm. focusing on that through small and medium enterprises uh, agency or a ministry, which is to create local entrepreneurs. This is the excitement of India for people like us. India has such a great variety of consumption. Every locality has some vendor, street vendor, who has a recipe that people love. People line up, right in South India, we used to line up for a, uh, Italy from some family. I mean, the right. family made a great Italy. In one hour, they are sold completely, right? Exactly. How can we take that recipe, make it more contemporary branded, so it travels beyond that locality? Okay. Great excitement. I can make companies after companies after companies because there's a market for that. Whatever unique recipe they have, and again, if you think is this a wild idea, no. Many of the cookies and uh, bakery products, you know, in America and Western world 
have come from grandma's recipe, as we call it. Yes, yes, yes. Somebody in the family. Right. And Haldiram is a good example in right. India. Yeah. We have an Indian company in America, or Deep Foods, which has done exactly that. A Patel family, she made great chevda, as a Gujarati yeah. chevda. Yeah. And people were raving about it. And they said, why don't you sell it, commercialize it? And they did it and rest is the history. To right. me, that's a great excitement in the rural market, discovering those recipes and contemporizing, modernizing, manufacturing in a more scale-based. Uh, I mean, the, the traditional farmer food is the next fashion now. Right, right, right. So I, I, I think this is very important in my previous talk with somebody uh, important in this space. He talked about revival of the traditional food and you yes. brought it to the entrepreneurship level and you brought it to a commercial yeah. uh, story level. So I think this is a very important point. And with nutrition as an agenda, with uh, uh, food becoming more important Absolutely. day by day. So this revival of this traditional food, but the way you are putting with more uh, in a rigor with uh, a professionalism around would be more critical. And I'll give you a couple of examples. It's already done in pickles, mm -hmm. in papad. Lijat papad is a well-known, all yes. homemakers making it. You know, they're, they're in the carbon area, but one can do Jaipur rug is a good example, 40,000 right. artisans, all in disadvantaged rural populations. I think we do have those things, but what we don't have is to say, how can we scale up that idea on a national basis or a global basis. Absolutely. Fab India has done very well by going back to the traditional things. Uh, you know, I mean, I can give examples after examples where uh, the the rural side has become the showcase in many ways. Yes. And many of the practices and the, and the traditions are becoming very helpful because in the wellness era, we are all discovering that those ancient grains are more valuable than the modern grains that we eat, for example not limited to food again we are talking only about food and beverages but true for garments for example true for shelter building food shelter and clothing right i think these are the uh, real wisdom uh, and we think the viewers would be definitely uh, taking nuggets and start utilizing that uh, in designing or developing certain programs so any last word for the uh, from the rural growth point of view, post-COVID, any last point, sir, that you think is important for us to learn? The last point is that we need to think reverse. Mm -hmm. Rural first, urban second. How do we keep population back in the rural area and make them so prosperous, so healthy, that they have no desire to come to a big city? Too much urbanization is not good for the nation. We need to have more distributed capabilities. In the COVID example, if you have a concentrated supply chain, it can paralyze a nation as America got paralyzed with so much dependence on China for everything. Yeah. yeah. More distributed the supply chain, the better off you are. And I think that is the excitement of reversing every thinking is start with rural first and then urban second mentally then everything clicks very well in my mind. Right. I think this is a fantastic way to conclude this conversation, though I want to continue with you. It's an opportunity for me to really uh, touch base with you after so many years. Uh, thank you very much for uh, finding time for us and giving all these nuggets. We will uh, cherish this forever. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.